1 Peter chapter 3 is where we are today. And I'm reminded of a story, a uh, true story actually, of a, of a pastor. And uh, he's telling me the story. And the pastor was going through a very difficult time. It seemed like he was getting attacked from every single angle. And he just didn't know where all that stuff was coming from. I mean, that's how, how it was. It was just one thing piled on another, just like many of you are feeling today. Well, he got a letter in the mail. And when he got this letter, found out who it was from, he thought, at last, someone to encourage me. It was a former staff person that he had helped out tremendously. And so he opened up the mail, and the first line that was read in the letter was, I, when I was on staff, I was faithful to you most of the time. Probably not what you want to hear or what you want to write. I mean, I can't imagine, you know, you're saying to your wife or your husband, I've been faithful to you most of the time. But, um, you know, and, and then he was, I guess he was going through a hard time, needed somebody to blame. And so he began to, began to blame that pastor. He, he told me, he said, halfway through the letter, I realized Satan had overplayed his hand. I suddenly realized all the stuff that was, I just never thought about a spiritual warfare behind the scenes going on in my own life. And exactly that's how God spoke to me. He said, it's just too much, too much. This is Satan at work. Well, we know that there is spiritual warfare taking place all around us, even in our situation today, not only with COVID-19, not only with uh, the racial tensions that are going on in our nation, but hey, hurricanes are coming, I hear, and that's just something else piled onto it, and we pray against them. Tony Dungy, the former coach of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and Indianapolis Colts, Super Bowl coach, a coach actually, winning coach, said this, we are willing to speak, we have to speak the truth in love, but we have to recognize that we are not fighting against other people. We are fighting against Satan and his kingdom of spiritual darkness. In the words of the Apostle Paul, do not overcome evil, but overcome evil with good. Romans 12, 21. Coach Dungy, a committed believer, had it right. We are in a spiritual warfare. Now, as Peter was writing this letter, please know he's not taking away human responsibility. As a matter of fact, he's been going through the different trials that the people in Peter's day were going through. And now he says, now look, before I end this letter, keep in mind that all around you, behind the scenes, is spiritual warfare taking place. And Douglas MacArthur, former general, and here in America, once said that there are four things you need to prepare for success. One thing is high morale among the troops, then training of personnel, number three, adequate source of supply, and number four, knowledge of the enemy. He went on to say, the greater the knowledge of the enemy, the greater your chance of victory. Again, Peter was writing to suffering Christians. They were under a great deal of persecution, but he's saying to, something to us in this letter that is very crucial to our understanding of the Christian life. And that is this, all of us go through trials. None of us are exempt. I don't care how close you are to God, you're gonna go through trials. Whether you're poor, whether you're rich, no matter what race you're from, color you're from, nationality you are from, all of us are going through trials and suffering in life. But here's what Tim Keller says about it. The destination of the Christian life is not that we escape trouble, but there is something within us that can turn the trouble into something great. Now, I know we're going through a tough time in our nation, and even now as I stood up and preached the first hour, I thought to myself, well, you know, you know how much of this is inflammatory? How much of this is this or that? How much do I really agree with what I'm saying? I might, may go home, my wife says, well, you know, you could have said this, and I, I might disagree with myself. I mean, you just don't know what to say anymore. You just don't know how to approach things. And then with the pandemic, you, you come to a place and you say, well, things are going down. No, things are going up. Well, the percentage of things are staying about the same. And you go back and forth with it on what to do. We have people that don't want to get out at all, and they feel like you can't get out at all. You have to wear a mask even when you're at home. And that's one extreme. And you got other people have not changed their life at all. And so you've got to know both sides and run the whole gamut. And so as we're looking at this, we understand that there's a spiritual battle for souls going on, but also a spiritual battle for our personal lives as well. 
And with all the discouragement, with all the happenings, with all the trials and troubles going on, we, we need to realize something, that there is a spiritual battle taking place behind the scenes. So I want us to look in this passage this morning, I want us to look at three things, the presence, the price, the prescription for the battle. Three Ps. First of all, I want us to see the presence of the battle. Peter is coming out of a passage where he's talking about how to treat one another. How He says, finally, brethren, in verse 8, have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, tender heart, a humble mind. And so he's saying to us, this is what you ought to do, and here's how you ought to do it, is Christ as the Lord of your life. And you're saying, well, yeah, but I have trouble with Christ being the Lord of my life. Well, Peter is saying one of the reasons why you have trouble is it's always something whispering in your ears, something attacking the mind, and that's where Satan's battleground really is, something that is attacking the mind that causes spiritual warfare that goes on within you. Look in verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. Once for sins, that is as opposed to in the Old Testament where they had to do sacrifices over and over and over again. He's saying once for all, you're talking about fairness, the one who is just dying for the unjust. The one who is sinless dying for the lives of sinners. In order to what? He says to bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, made alive in the spirit. We talked about being, having, being living letters, living epistles before the Lord, living stones before the Lord. Then he goes on to say in verse 19, in which he went, Jesus went, and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. What does this mean? In the passage we're about to look at, Martin Luther, the great reformer, said about this passage, after reading it, after studying it, after and about ready to present it, he simply said this, I have no idea what this passage means. And so, oh, here I am trying to explain it. Then he goes on to explain it, of course. But in the, Old, in the Old Testament, the Bible says in Isaiah 14 that Satan fell. He rebelled against God. He wanted to be God, like God. He wanted to be the idol of his own life. And one-third of the demons or angels fell with him. Some of those angelic beings or demonic beings are out here in the world today whispering things in our ear, playing with our mind, putting ideas into our head, and tempting us. Others were so powerful, the Bible says they were put in a, in a prison. Then notice, it further complicates things where it says, because they formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared. What, what is it talking about? Why bring out Noah? Well, in Genesis chapter 6, another difficult passage to deal with. And the Bible tells us this. It says there were sons of God... And in the Old Testament, that often meant demonic forces. And I've got a, a series about that that you can look at online. But it, it says there, before the flood came, the sons of God, the sons of man, the sons of God, meaning demonic forces, were actually having children with human women. Now, you, you talk about freakish things happening. And so we find that these were tossed into the prison after the flood. And so here we are in prison. And he says, I, he says he went and proclaimed them. Now, there is uh, spiritual warfare going all throughout this book. In fact, in five, verse, chapter 5, verse 8, we'll get to in just about a month or so. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Then in verse 22 of the same chapter, chapter 3, it says, who has gone into heaven is at, at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers, and angels, authorities, and powers. Angels are usually the good guys. The authorities and powers uh, in Peter's writings and Paul's writings are usually the bad guys. They're the demonic forces. And so all throughout this book, we see that Peter speaks to that. Paul spoke to that by saying this, by counseling out the record of debt that stood against us and legal demands. He set aside, nailing it to the cross. He, he put our sins aside by nailing it to the cross. And at that time, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them into open shame by triumphing over them in, in him. How did he do that? How did he, Well, the Bible says that in between the crucifixion and the resurrection, 
in Ephesians 4, he went down into a place where the Old Testament saints were and led away captivity captive. I know I'm getting down into the weeds here a little bit, but I'm trying, trying to do the best I can. He led away cap- the Old Testament saints into heaven before the resurrection. At least he got them out of the prison. Near them what was a prison for those who were lost and for the demonic forces. And here we find where Jesus went out. He didn't preach the gospel to them. No, this word proclaimed in verse 19 means to herald. Uh, today, we get our news in various sources. And we get our news from uh, maybe the internet. You get your news from uh, one of the television state 24-hour news stations. You may get your uh, network news or whatever way you get your news. We can, it's susceptible to us really 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You know, it's amazing to me with everything that's going on. Uh, one of the pastors brought out to me that back in 1968 or so, 69, whenever it was, there was a great flu that, that really came across America. And 100,000 people in America died from that flu and nothing shut down. Nothing. I remember that. I, I remember the flu. That's how old I am. I remember it, barely, barely, remember it, all right, barely. And I can remember not doing anything different at all. But the difference in back then, we had 30 minutes of news locally. And then right after that, the Huntley-Brinkley Report or Walter Cronkite came on, whoever, for, for 30 minutes. We had one hour of news every day. Now we have 24 hours, of news, and we can get it on multiple stations, Somebody said, man, we would solve most of the problems of this country if we put a moratorium on the news for about 30 days. I I think maybe that's true. I don't know. But here we find here a herald came through the city. Wasn't much news. A crier. He would come through the city and announce the news. Well, announcing the news, he was heralding the news. He was proclaiming it. And so we find that Jesus went in, captivity captive, got those people out of prison, or out of a place where the Old Testament saints were, near there was the prison, and he proclaimed victory, victory over the devil, victory over sin, victory over life and death, And as he's proclaiming it because of what he did on the cross. Now, the Bible tells us there is Satan. Satan's purpose is to embarrass God and, and hurt God by destroying his greatest creation and that is man. Now, you say, we have a responsibility, don't we? We sure do. We do have a responsibility. Some of you don't remember the show, Flip Wilson um, show, but he used to have a a character where he would dress up, and he would, his favorite phrase, the devil made me do it. Well, is that true? That became a phrase all throughout America, the devil made me do it. Well, no, the devil doesn't make you really do anything. We all have a choice a responsibility. We are tempted, but we have a responsibility on whether we're going to yield to that temptation or not. Now, it's been estimated, in fact, I've heard this many, many times, that that if we as Christians, in fact, the answer to everything that's going on in our nation today is Jesus. If people would just receive Christ into their heart, and we discover that those areas where the gospel is really preached... Not a social gospel, but the real gospel is actually preached, then things are better. But here's the thing 22% of Americans claim to be born again. And that's pretty significant. You say, well, that's not as many as it used to be. No, it's not. It's not. But 22%. Now, if that were true, I'm not sure that it is. In fact, I'm pretty sure that that's an overestimation because anybody can say they're born again, right? But if 22% of the Christians are here, why aren't we having more of an impact on our world? I mean, after all, Jesus said, you're like the salt. You're salt in the earth. Well, if you take 100 pounds of meat and put 20, 22 pounds of salt in the meat, you're going to have really salty meat, I think, right? I'm not a cook, but I think so. It would, it would seem reasonable to me. And so if we as Christians were really making an impact on the world, as salt is to meat, then why aren't we changing society in a positive way for the cause of Christ? 
Uh, George Barna, who writes a lot of books, does a lot of surveys of America, especially religious America, uh, talks about, in fact, anytime I want to get depressed, I just read George Barna. Anytime I want to get suicidal or whatever, I, I just read George Barna. And so, uh, I mean, always, you know, he's saying right now, 48% of you are watching online. Christians who are regular members of the church who go regularly, 48% are watching online. It's just fallen way off. It's gone from close to 100 down to 48. And some of you are not even watching our church. I mean, I'm not saying, you know, he hasn't surveyed our church. But their own church, they're watching somebody else's church. And so there's a commitment level, level there. Satan has used many situations against the church. Now, why is it that we're not really impacting those around us? Barna says, we're not living any different from the rest of the world. He says he, he weighs all these questions that he asks believers and all these questions that he asks non-believers and they all answer him back the same way, how, how they are actually living. So people are looking at our lives and they're saying, I don't see, why, why would I want Jesus? They don't seem to have any more answers than I have. But also, why in the world we ask ourselves, don't, don't we have prayer power? Why don't we have influence in our society? Maybe it's because we have not really tried living the Christian life. Someone has aptly said, it is not the Christian life doesn't work, but that it's never really been tried. The gospel is the answer. But the gospel is the answer because we are not only receiving Christ, but he changes our life in an extremely positive way. He gives us love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, kindness, self-control. We look in 1 Peter uh, chapter 3. Finally, brother, unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, a humble mind. We have all these things as Jesus Christ comes in to our heart. But is he really there? Is he really there as Lord of our life? Now, we have, um, a lot of, we have a lot of challenges in America, more challenges than most nations. And one of the things, we're, we're the freest nation on earth. And so we have freedom of thought, we have freedom of religion, we have freedom of speech, but also we are a melting pot of so many different people. We are. You know, you, if you go to Romania, you'll find most of the people in Romania have one, one thing in common. They're all Romanians. If you go to Japan, you'll find most of those people are Japanese. China, most of those people are China. You come to America, and we're, we run the gamut. All races, all nationalities, all religions. And so we have this melting pot and then we have emotions rising to the surface because we, we feel like we have the answer to so many things. And then it becomes a difficulty of bringing people really together. But listen, I'll make an emphatic statement here. And I believe it's to be true. If we as a church have been living the Christian life the last hundred years, the way the Bible says we ought to live it, we would not have racism today. Racism, racism would be dead. And I might add to this, poverty would almost be dead, but only coming upon those who refuse to work. It'd almost be gone. But instead, either we're not living the Christian life, we've never really been saved, or we're so preoccupied. And Satan has got us preoccupied with so many other things in life that we're not the salt and light to the world. How does Satan really attack us? Well, he does it through discouragement. Some of you here today are extremely discouraged. You're discouraged about the economy. You know, some people are worried about the pandemic, and, and those people who are involved in disease control, they'll admit that's all they're about. That's it. They're, they're not economists. They're not politicians. Some of you even said they're all political. All only thing they're concerned about is one thing, and I'm glad they're concerned about that one thing. But where's the balance to it all? You look at it and the discouragement that we're experiencing. Everybody here has had, in the past at least, someone that's an elected official, and you think, now that we've elected them, everything's going to change for us, and it didn't. On both sides of the aisle. Disappointment. Discouragement. Some of you have sent your children out into the world, and you've tried to raise them in the Lord as best you can. 
And the world's taken them and done something else totally with them. Some of you are at home and you're discouraged about maybe your marriage because now you're having to really live with the person that you married for the first time maybe in a long time and you don't like what you're finding. You're not getting along. You're discouraged. You're discouraged about work. You're discouraged about business. You're discouraged about everything that's happening around you and the, and, and the, and the protesting and, and the killing. You're discouraged. Satan's greatest tool in, our, in his arsenal, I believe, is discouragement. And it can happen to the believer as well. Pride. A refusal to receive Christ is all about, about pride. I, I think I can save myself. I, I, can go to, I don't need the cross. I, I can get saved. I can get into the saving business. I can save myself in some way. Or I'm not going to listen to anyone else. I already have the answers. Why should I listen to you? In fact, the only reason I'm listening to you, I'm listening to you so I can come up with an answer. I'm not even listening to you. I'm trying to come up with a response. Why am I trying to do that? Well, because, because I think I know it all already. I don't have to learn anything new. In fact, I already know what you're going to say before you say it. No, you don't. You really don't. But yet, pride comes in. Blind spots in our life. Blind spots. Places where Satan has got us so maybe busy or wrapped up in something that we can't even see it. You learn something new about yourself and you think, wow, why couldn't I see that before? It was a blind spot. Whether it's selfishness, pride, or just simply a, a busyness of life that you're concentrating on something else, you just can't seem to come to a place of really seeing it before us. Your life gets busy. And so what happens? You get detoured a little bit. I mean, after all, you're, you're trying to do well in your business life. Your career is taking so much of your time. And even when you don't want it to take up the time, your boss is coming to you and say, you've got to do this, 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 and this. You've got to work tonight. You've got to work the weekends. And you think, when am I going to have even any time at all for my own children? And so you try to spend time with your kids. And there's no other time really left. No time really for your spouse. No time for your church work at all. Did you know that the typical person growing up in a church, typical young person needs five adults in their life that are exemplary of Jesus Christ to influence them in their life? We have in churches all over America, we've got these large churches and, and they're, they're turning out people that, children just like in the smaller churches, they're turning out with all the resources that we have, turning out children for the world. What, what, what's happening there? Well, money won't do it. It just won't do enough. You've got to get involved in people's life. And what about the world? Here you are raising your kids and you think, well, you know, I've, maybe I've done this. I've sent them Christian school. I've homeschooled. I've done this. I've done that. And, and you send them out into the world, but you haven't influenced any of the world that you're sending your children to. So they're going out in the world where they don't have your influence whatsoever. Their friends are not having, you haven't had any influence over their friends and no influence over the world, no influence over society and the culture and what's going on in the world. And they go out into the world unprepared or maybe even prepared. But they go along with the crowd. We're detoured. We're so busy. We're so busy. And then what, what do we do? We look and we look to blame some, something or someone. Just like the guy who wrote a letter to his past, former pastor. His life wasn't going well. His ministry wasn't going well. So what do we want to do? We want to blame somebody. Anybody you could. We want to look to the past and we get angry about it. And you know this to be true. You look and you say, well, you know, this guy hurt me or this person really hurt me and this is what happened to my, my marriage and this is what happened, my parent hurt me in this way. And we look to the past and look to the past and look to the past and what do we do? We become angry and bitter and fail to look to the future for a solution. We get detoured in life and Satan is behind it all, constantly attacking us. And you say, well, I just don't, you know, pastor, I don't even know if I believe in, in Satan or not. D. Martin Lloyd-Jones has said this, not to realize that you are in a conflict means one thing only. And it's not that, that you, are, you are so hopelessly, you are already hopelessly defeated, he says. You do not even know it. You are unconscious 
It means that you are completely defeated by the devil. Anyone who is not aware of a fight and a conflict in a spiritual sense is in a drugged and hazardous condition. Wow, what a, what a quote by a great scholar. Andrew DeBonco wrote a book. He's an atheist guy and wrote a book called The Death of Satan. And he says, you know, Satan doesn't exist. But then as he goes on in the book, he realizes, as he's writing the book, he says, I realize there's no way that you can explain the evil that goes on in the world unless there's something else behind it. Now, here's a guy that doesn't even believe the Bible. But he looks at life and he says, there's got to be some kind of evil behind it. An evil behind, behind killing an evil behind uh, some of the, the violence that we're experiencing today. And if you don't get that, picture yourself right now. Picture yourself. And you're on a ship. And you're on your way to Africa. Why? You're going to take people away from their kids and their wives and their life, put them on a ship, chain them down, take them to another country so they can look, work out in the cotton fields. Who does that? You say, well, that was a different day. I don't care what day it was. Who does that? What is behind that? If that's not a devilish thing, I, I just don't know what is. And every society that's been big, big countries, Rome and, and, and all the other empires, seem to have one thing in common. They, at one point, had some kind of slavery going on, taking advantage of someone else to make money for you. You say, well, I just don't know. There's just so many things going on. The battle is here, and the battle is, 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 is going and raging on and on and on. And when we do this, dear friends, and we keep looking to the past and to, sit to the future and real solutions, what happens in our life? We come up with crazy stuff. Here you are without a job, so what do you do? You just, you, you just pick up and maybe, maybe move. Radical stuff. Stuff that you just think, I've got to do something. I've, I've got to do something. Right now, with all the things going on with our African-American community, some people are coming up with the idea of doing away with police. Listen, you don't want to live in a society like that. You just don't. And again, what I said last week, you throw out the baby with the bathwater, and you say, well, there's some bad preachers, and there are. And, and there's some bad priests, and there are. But that don't mean you, you, you get rid of all of them. We need people preaching the gospel of Christ. And so we look at this, and we understand that there is a spiritual battle that's raging behind the scenes. And until we, re, we, we win the one behind the scenes, we're not going to win the one on the scene. And so we look, and we look at the price I've got to hurry up with this. It says, for the Christ also suffered, verse 18. Jesus Christ suffered on the cross. A few years ago, I brought a message um, over our gathering here in Oviedo, our first one. Uh, we met over in the bank parking lot. All races, all uh, gospel-centered churches met over there. We had a great time together. message I preached out of Ephesians 2 had to do with how we build a house. Now, I know when in Florida, you build them, we build them with cement, cement block. I know that because of termites. But in, in Georgia, what we would do, sometimes we'd throw down a slab, sometimes we would build it up with concrete block and build a wooden floor. But one of the things that we did, we, we would build the walls out of two befores and stand, then after we built them, we would stand them up and then nail them all together. But they wouldn't stay together. What we'd have to do is brace those. And the reason I know this, my dad built several houses. And so I, I had to help him, and I, I realized, that I asked one day as a little guy, why do we have to put this board up? All we're going to do is take it down. He said, well, that's a bracing. Until we get the roof on, the walls aren't sturdy enough, they'll fall. So then they, you put the roof on, and it, it stabilizes the building. And once you get the na roof nailed on, it stabilizes the whole house. Now, I liken that into the fact that Jesus said, Two, two things in the law. One, you shall love your, uh, the Lord your God with your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then the second one is love your neighbor as yourself. Taking those two things in consideration. When you and I, before we're saved at least, we are in a prison. A prison of our own sin. Bondage to our own habits. And here we are, we have walls all around us, walling us off from the rest of society and a ceiling right on the top of us, a roof shutting us off from God. 
When the roof comes off, the moment I received Jesus in my heart, the roof just came off. I had access to God, the Bible says. I had access to prayer. I had access to the throne of God. I had a relationship with God. I was reconciled to God. The just died for the unjust to bring me to God. So what happens? The roof is off. And so the walls will eventually fall. The barriers that we have between one another will eventually fall because we're loving one another. We realize there, there are some differences. There are, they realize there are some challenges in every relationship. And we work through those challenges because the walls have come down. Jesus Christ died not only for, for us to have a relationship with him, but also a relationship with others as well. Notice in verse 19, we read it. Verse 20, he talks about the ark, and he says, look, you know, the ark, eight persons were saved. The ark is a symbol of, of, the, of Jesus Christ. They were safe in the ark. And verse 21, he talks about baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. He comes right back to salvation. And he says, not a removal of the dirt of the body. He's not talking here, he says, about water baptism, but an appeal to to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's talking about the, the, the he's talking about 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 13 it says we are all baptized into one body in Christ. That happens the word baptism just means to immerse. So we are immersed in the context of this book in the Holy Spirit with the Holy Spirit. And because of that we're saved. The water baptism is a picture of that inward salvation that we have. Notice it begins to talk to us about uh, the, the, uh, the picture of the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And here what Peter is saying is, is that through this baptism of the Holy Spirit within our heart, the victory is already won. We, we don't fight for victory. We fight from the place of victory. Jesus Christ has already done everything on the cross for us. And so real quickly, what's the prescription to this? We notice in verse 1 of chapter 4, there's a commitment involved. Since therefore Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. We'll come back to the arm in just a moment. He says, so to live in the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. He says, be committed, not to the passions. And he begins to describe those. He says, as the Gentiles, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking, parties, and lawless idolatry. And he says, we respect to this. They are surprised when you don't join them. He says, let me tell you about the world. You get out in the world and you, you don't join in with them. They think you're weird. They think you're strange because they're living for the now. We, we have to have pleasure now. We have to have something going on in our life now. We have to have social justice now because we, can't, we won't find it in the afterlife because there is no afterlife. We're living for the now. And they can't understand why you would possibly think there was a spiritual side to everything. A commitment. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will hear their prayer and heal their land. Are we repenting? Are we really living for Jesus? Do we have that hotline to heaven? that God wants us to have. Peter has said, look, verse one, chapter one, verse three, you're born again. He says in two, five, he says you're living stones. He says you get there by, in chapter three, verse 15, by making Jesus Christ as Lord of your life. We see this and we, we know that we have opposition always. He says your commitment to Jesus Christ which will include an outward walk that the rest of the world looks at and says, wow, you're different. You, you handle things differently. It's not just all about the emotional stuff. Passion's great. It is. Fire is wonderful in the fireplace, but not in the walls. And so often, and the world gets the fire in the walls. But I want you to notice there's a commitment, but there's also a reminder here of a cross. In verse four, verse one, it says, arm yourselves in the same way of thinking. What way of thinking? In chapter three, verse 18, Christ suffered once for all sins, the righteous for the unrighteous to bring us to God. He says, remember the cross. Remember what Jesus Christ, he says, arm yourselves, make it a weapon in your life. 
as you fight off the fiery darts of the devil, which Ephesians 6 talks about, arm yourself with this thought. Jesus died for you. Here's the problem that we have as believers. We look to the past at our suffering. And God says, nope, wrong way to do it. That's cause anger. It's going to cause bitterness. You don't look to the past at your suffering. You look to the past at Jesus' suffering on the cross. And that is the time that you are going to be grateful in your life. Paul said, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. John Stott says, until we see what God has done for us, we cannot see what he can do for us. You're going through the pandemic. You look to the cross. And you say, look what Jesus has done for me. He suffered and died on the cross for me. And it says in Romans, he, if he will not spare his only son, will he not also freely give me all things? You're going through a tough time in your marriage and you think to yourself, there's nothing that can salvage this thing. But you look back on the cross and you're enlightened and you're grateful and you feel like, God, you have done so much for us. What, what's the alternative there? Look what the world's looking at today. There's an entitlement there. Listen, if, you, if, you, if your parents bought you your first car, you're a, little, you, you've, you're a little blessed. Paid for your education, you're very blessed. We have a world today, well, Jesus died on the cross. Well, of course he did. I mean, that's his job, right? It was his calling to die for us. And every time we take the Lord's Supper, we're reminded of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What he's done for us. And there's a conviction in our heart that one day everything is going to work for God's glory, for our good. Justice is coming in the world. Just as the book of Revelation talks about it. It says here, he says in verse um, 24, um, or rather verse 8 of chapter 21. But it's for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, for murderers, the sexual, immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, all liars. Their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. He says, look, there's, there's a day coming where there's a reckoning. There is justice that's going to be served on that side. But then he says, then I saw an angel. He showed me the river, the water of life, a symbol of Jesus, bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and the lamb through the middle of the street in the city also on either side of the river, the tree of life, which is the 12 kinds of fruit. He goes on, no longer will there be any accursed, but the throne of God and the lamb of God will be in it and his servants will worship him and you will see his face. The whole name is going to be on your foreheads. It's going to be a day. You say, no, I long for the justice somehow now. Now, that's, that's the secular word for now. I've got to have my pleasure now. I've got to have my success now. I've got to have justice now. And we don't live in heaven. We don't live in a utopia. You can pray for it. You can ask for it. You can dream of it. It's not going to happen on earth. The Bible says all of us share in sufferings here on this earth. And the question is, how are we going to get through those sufferings? Again, Tim Keller has said, if the difference in the Christian life and destination of the Christian life is not that we escape trouble, but there's something within us that turns that trouble into a great blessing, turns that trouble into something great. How does that happen? The Spirit of God lives within us, and we affect our own life. And the Spirit of God affects us, and it affects the ministry within the church and the ministry outside the church that we can be prepared for that day when the attacks come. Are you prepared today? Are you prepared? Can you say, I know that I'm prepared to meet the onslaught of any suffering, any temptation, any discouragement in life because I know that Jesus Christ lives in my heart because that's really the first thing. That's what... Peter is saying, you've got to be born again. And once you're born again, you have the platform there. You have the foundation to do something great with whatever comes about you in your life. And so the question is today, do you know that you're saved? Do you know it? Or did you just pray a prayer one day, got baptized one day, thought, hey, you know, everything's going to be taken care of. No, was there a change in your life? 
to where that change revolutionized your life, but also made such a change in your life that everything afterwards, after, everything afterwards is seen in a brand new light. If not, I want to give you an opportunity today to receive Christ into your heart as your Savior and Lord. As we bow our heads today, I want to encourage you to pray this prayer with me silently or there in your homes out loud as I pray. Lord God, I want to make a difference. I want to be the answer. I want to be the solution, part of the solution, and not part of the problem. And God, I pray that you would save me now. I pray that Jesus would come into my life. I pray that you would forgive me of all my sins. And I pray that I can become that kind of person that you envision me to be. That you can make me as the Spirit of God lives inside of me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.